out of darkness and go to your marvelous light. second song I'm forgiven because you were forsaken
right? So I'm going to ask Joseph to pray. അങ്ങനെ നമുക്ക് വേണ്ടി വെച്ചിരിക്കുന്ന വാചനങ്ങൾ മനസ്സിലാക്കാനുള്ള ബുദ്ധിയും ജ്ഞാനം നമുക്ക് തോന്നുള്ളൂ എന്ന് പ്രാർത്ഥിക്കുന്നു വിശേഷൻ എടുക്കുന്ന മനുഷ്യരുടെ നഗരങ്ങളിലേക്ക് തരുന്നു നമ്മൾ ഇതുവരെ വിട്ടുപോയിട്ടുള്ള പല കാര്യങ്ങളും പറയാൻ ആഗ്രഹിക്കുന്ന അങ്ങ് നമ്മളിലേക്ക് ആഗ്രഹിക്കാൻ ആഗ്രഹിക്കുന്ന മെസ്സേജ് കറക്റ്റായിട്ട് മനുഷ്യരിലെപ്പോഴും നമ്മളിലേക്ക് വരാൻ സാധിക്കണം ദൈവമേ പുള്ളിക്ക് അതിന് നല്ല കഴിവുകൾ കൊടുക്കുന്നതാണ് സ്വർണ്ണം ചെയ്യുന്നു ദൈവമേ അങ്ങ് തന്നെ മനുഷ്യരുടെ കൂടി ഇരിക്കുമാറാണമേ ഈ മീറ്റിങ്ങിലേക്ക് ഇനി വന്ന് ചേരാൻ ആഗ്രഹിക്കുന്ന ആൾക്കാരെയും എല്ലാ കണക്കരങ്ങളിലേക്ക് പരിമേലിപ്പിക്കുന്നു അവർക്ക് ചെയ്യാനുള്ള കൃപ ഒരുക്കി കൊടുക്കാമെന്ന് പ്രാർത്ഥിക്കുന്നു എല്ലാ കണക്കരങ്ങളിലേക്ക് പരിമേലിപ്പിച്ചുകൊണ്ട് നമ്മൾ ഏറ്റവും കൂട്ടുന്ന ഞാനും കേൾക്കണം കാരണം നല്ല പിതാവേ ആമേ Thank you, Joseph. Right. So, good evening. This evening we thought we would start with a new book. We have finished the book of James. And uh, you know, I, was, I was planning on starting uh, either the book of Job or the book of Acts again. But then... Uh, you know acts we have already done in in our uh, classrooms so and the uh, revelation is a book you know we, we had started long back but we had left it halfway i think some years back and uh, this group in uh, on tuesdays you know we had this great curiosity and thirst to understand this book so i thought why not do a revelation and uh, you know for this study i'm uh, basically focusing on Uh, a devotional on revelation uh, understanding it as a bible study and how to apply the truths of the book of revelation in our daily lives okay seeing christ in the book of revelation that's our focus for every day that we study this book okay and this is a foundational book i mean foundational study uh, it's not an in depth study like uh, you know we don't go into very very deep uh, you know arguments and uh, things like that on different viewpoints on certain things i will be highlighting some of the very po- view points that are there but we won't be dwelling too much on the different view points that people have we'll be focusing mainly on the concepts that we need for our application and personal life uh, spiritual growth in our, in our personal situation okay so this is the context in which we are going to study the book of revelation now uh, just to uh, uh, just to get things right you know many people are afraid of studying the book of revelation mainly because they say that they don't understand most of the uh, details that are given there and that's why they are not willing to read the book of revelation or or to study the book of revelation but uh, many people don't read the book of revelation because they are afraid of the events that are happening in the future you know they say that uh, they are uh, afraid that will the end of the world and things like that is a little scary so they don't want to read and understand and study the book but the reason why we should study the book of revelation is that first and for, uh, basically it is part of the bible and every book that is part of the bible has to be studied so every book is useful for uh, encouragement reproof correction and uh, for spiritual growth so we have to study all the books equally and so in that context this is also an important book that we have to study plus God speaks today through the book of revelation also God speaks through the book of psalms God speaks through the gospels and God speaks through revelation also so in all these uh, you know uh, reasons it is good enough that we should study the book of revelation and it is the only book which actually guarantees us that there is a blessing every time we read the book okay. now that is we can interpret it in a way that you know every book of the bible you read you have, you are blessed but this is specifically in this book it is given that there is blessing when you read the book of this uh, you know uh, uh, when you read the text of this book uh, turn to revelation chapter 1 and verse 3 blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it for the time is near 
So blessed. Who is blessed? The one who reads. Who is blessed? One who hears. And who is blessed? The one who keeps what is written. Okay, so application is key in this book. So it's not enough that we hear that. It's not in, uh, in, uh, enough that we read it aloud. But it is, it is great uh, blessing when we keep what is written in it. So the time is near. Okay. So without much ado, let us go into the introduction for the book of Revelation. Right. First and primarily, the author. The author is understood to be John the Apostle. Okay? The Apostle of Jesus, uh, uh, John, is the one who wrote this book. Now, Jesus chose 12 to be apostles, to be with him and to take the uh, you know gospel uh, to the world. So, the, these basic the 12 people, among that was this one man whose name was John. He was the son of Zebedee and uh, he was the brother of James. In this book, the key people are John the Apostle and Jesus. Okay, the key people that are mentioned in this book are Jesus and John. Next, what is the purpose of this book? The purpose of this book of Revelation is to reveal the full identity of Christ and to give warning and hope to believers. To reveal the full identity of Christ and to give warning and hope to believers. Okay, now I'll explain that. What do you mean by the full identity of Christ? See, Christ came 2000 years ago and we are celebrating the Christmas, the Advent season, uh, you know, in, in um, proclaiming that Christ came as a man. Christ came as a baby in a manger and he lived among us. He grew up just like a normal boy grows up. He grew up among us and he lived among us. He, he spoke among us. He uh, ate food with us. He slept with us. He did everything that normal human beings do. He was among us. And then he suffered and died under Pontius Pilate. And he went to the cross, not for his sins, but our sins. And then he was crucified. He died on the cross. Then he was buried and he rose up and he ascended to heaven. Okay. Now, that was his first coming. In that first coming, he was relatable as a carpenter's son. He was relatable as this mother's baby in the manger. He was relatable as the friend of sinners. He was relatable as a great teacher, a rabbi. He, had, he was relatable in humanly terms. He was just like us. And that is why all these paintings and pictures, you know, this, they, they have this uh, uh, image of Jesus uh, as a man with long flowing hair and very, very good features, uh, very good uh, moustache and a long beard, a trimmed and shaped beard. And then uh, he looks very pleasant and pleasing to the eye. But the Bible says he was just looking just like any other Jew. You know, he was normal looking. There is no descriptions of his face or his height or his looks given anywhere in the Bible. But when it comes to revelation, this is how Christ is now. In that coming, he looked like a normal human being. But when we are going to see him face to face, when he's going to come again as a second coming, he is not going to look like a normal Hebrew person. Okay. He is going to look different. And that is what the full identity of Christ. You know, how he is now. The Christian should not be surprised when he sees Christ saying that, oh, I was expecting this guy from the pictures or I was expecting this, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, handsome looking features, you know from the paintings. No, don't be surprised. He was not like that at all. But at the same time, when you see him next, he's not going to be like that at all. Okay. So don't be surprised. A person, a Christian who sees him face to face should not be caught unaware. That is why John wants to reveal the full identity of Christ, who he is fully. Okay. Not only in his looks and appearance, but also in his character. We have to know that he is much more than the good shepherd. He is much more than just the rabbi. He is much more than whom we have understood. Okay, So the Bible reveals much more of his complete identity through the book of Revelation also. 
okay to other parts of scripture and through the books of book of revelation the full identity of christ is revealed to us okay so a christian would not be caught unaware when he sees christ secondly to give warning and hope to believe warning means uh, something great is coming what is that when christ comes again there is going to be the final judgment of the world so the warning is don't be caught on the wrong side of the judgment see if you are on the side of jesus you are safe his blood covers over you and you are declared not guilty and because of that the warning is to be on the right side of christ don't be on the opposite side of christ because they are the enemies of christ and you would not want to be on the side of the enemies of christ so as a warning this book is a warning that get right with christ now don't wait for the judgment once you have life here on earth is finished there is no other chance that is going to be given to you so it's a warning it's a stern warning to those who are thinking that they would commit their lives to christ at the 11th hour be aware that you will die at 10:59 you may not get the chance to see the 11th hour okay so there's a warning just to make you understand that you should be caught on the right side of christ and not on the opposite side as christ's enemies and hope to all believers why hope because people are going through a lot of persecution and the people who go through persecution must be encouraged people who are believers go through different levels of persecution and trials and because of that this book is a a uh, hope giving book that is saying hold on to your faith the end is coming hold on to your faith christ has not forgotten you he is coming for you okay so in that way the this book gives hope to believers so so the perfect purpose of this book is threefold to reveal the identity full identity of christ and to give warning to all people and to give hope to believers right let's go to the third one who is the original audience of this book the original audience of this book are the seven churches which are found in annate kalate asia minor okay asia minor is the present day turkey and so there were seven churches in asia minor to which this book is written to okay so the original audience are the seven churches in asia minor and they were all consisting of believers inside them and they were written to believers okay so this letter of revelation was written to believers now when was this book written approximate date that has been confirmed by scholars is ad 95 in ad 95 this one of the last books that were written and uh, it was written by john when he was exiled you know uh the the king called uh the the, the roman king called Dom- uh, i think it is uh, domation uh, forget the name not nero the king after that okay so uh, Do- domitian d o m i t i a n domitian that's the name emperor domitian ad 90 to 95 that's the time he was ruling that is the time john was exiled to an island called patmos and at this island he was losing his eyesight he was blind you know he had been roasted in oil he had been uh, persecuted for his faith all the other apostles had died as martyrs and here was john being exiled to patmos as a blind apostle and he was there in this island prison called patmos and it is at this place that john had the revelation from jesus okay so ad 90 uh, to 95 was the time when emperor domitian ruled d o m i t i a n that is his spelling d o m i t i a n emperor domitian okay so ad 90 to 95 was his term as ruler that time in 95 uh, most probably when john was at patmos he wrote it okay now why was he exiled there john was exiled there because of his faith in jesus christ okay he was exiled because of his faith in he was it was part of his persecution so john was an eye witness to the incarnate christ he had a vision here of the glorified christ see now god was also going to show john what was going to take place in the future 
judgment and the ultimate triumph that God is going to have over evil. Okay, So John was an eyewitness of the incarnate Christ. When he first came, John was an eyewitness. He was walking with Christ, eating with Christ, sleeping with Christ. He was always part of the disciples team. And then he was given this vision of the glorified Christ, how Christ is right now. And God gave him the revelation of what would take place in the future. Judgment and the ultimate triumph of God over evil. Now, what is the key verse in this, in this book? The key verse in this book is chapter 1 and verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because of the time is near. Okay, so that's where the warning is. That's where the hope is. Time is near. Okay, from the time Jesus ascended to the heavenlies till his second coming is the last days. Last days are already started. In these last days, says Jesus, you know, the time after his coming till the time of his second coming is the last days. Okay, God does not calculate time according to our convenience. He calculates it on a standard and that standard is these are the last days. So you would say 2000 years is last days? Yes. The last 2000 years has been last days. We are close to the last day of the last days but more closer than John was when he wrote the book of Revelation. Okay. So we are closer to the end. That is why this is all the more relevant book. So seven churches of Asia Minor, Patmos, the island, P-A-T-M-O-S, the island on which uh, John was exiled and there is also a new city that is being mentioned. It is called the New Jerusalem. Okay, these are the key places in this book. Patmos, the seven churches of Asia Minor and the New Jerusalem. Now, one more thing about the style of writing. The style of writing is, it is called an apocalyptic form. Okay? The revelation is written in an apocalyptic form. What is that? It is a type of Jewish literature that uses symbolic imagery to communicate hope. It is a, sim it is a way of Jewish writing with using symbols, imagery to communicate hope. Okay? Here, God is going to ultimately triumph. And those who are undergoing persecution, they have to be given hope. And this literature gives symbolic imagery to communicate that hope. The events are ordered according to literary rather than chronological patterns. The events are recorded according to literary patterns, not strictly in chronological patterns. Okay, what this means is it does not follow this event after this event, this event after it can be happening simultaneously. It can be happening one before the other or one after the other. It need not be in the chronological order. It's not strictly in that order. Most of the things are in order, but some things may not be in that strict order. But mainly the literary style is being followed throughout, which chooses jumping up and down on the timeline. Okay. That's what it means. So apocalyptic form is a Jewish literature that uses symbolic imagery to communicate Okay, now, who is the author of this book? The author of this book has been identified by the writer itself as John. Chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John. Verse 2. Who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ even to all that he saw all that he saw. Okay, So John himself identifies himself as the author. Then chapter 1 verse 4. John to the seven churches that are in Asia. Jesus had commanded John to write and John was writing to the four churches in Asia. Chapter 1 verse 9. I John your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos. See, so all these details that I gave you just now was already there in the book itself. Okay, So it's not my own creation. It is not parallel literature. 
it is from the book of Revelation itself. Okay, turn with me to chapter 22 and verse 8. Again, identifying who the writer is. Chapter 22, verse 8. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. When I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel. Okay, so I, John. John is the person who has written this part. Okay, now. <coughs> There are many, many arguments against it. We are not going deep into that. Many, many uh, bishops uh, who came later on in the 3rd century, 4th century, all of them fought to say that, you know, the literary style of this book is different from John's gospel. The literary style of this book is different from 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. They agree that, you know, some people agree that uh, John's gospel and 1 John, 2 John, 3 John is written by John. But Revelation is not written by John because of the writing style because his apocalyptic style is used in this so there are a lot of arguments and a lot of you know counter arguments for that but uh, ask ourselves this question what do we know about john see according to the gospels john was a fisherman by trade most people suggest that john came from a wealthy family because they owned their own boats they had uh, you know, their livelihood was from the fishing industry. John, along with his brother, were, were some, one of the, some of the first disciples of Jesus. They were known as sons of thunder. Now, in Luke chapter 9, verse 54, there the nickname is, you know, best illustrated. When John and James, uh, they, they were with Jesus when Jesus was rejected. He was prevented from entering into a village. A town you know and then john and james says let us call down fire from heaven see the samaritan village that rejected jesus the messiah has been now rejected so they felt very insulted they felt more humiliated than jesus himself so they said let us call down fire of judgment you know from heaven upon these people so they would be sons of thunder you know they had no mercy they were explosive guys they wanted judgment to take place then. And they were also people who were very much uh, concerned about sitting on the right side and left side of Jesus. Ambitious people. They wanted fame, authority. They wanted to be better than the others. That's the kind of people that James and John comes across as. But then we find out that the other disciples also hated them because of this one-upmanship. They had no humility. They were proud guys. And that is what set them apart from the other fellows. Other fellows also proud. They wanted to compete with John and James. Okay. So, now, what we understand as a life lesson from John's life is that throughout his life, by serving the church, serving Jesus Christ, he has learned humility. In his first letter, verse John, you know, he says, John refers to himself as a fellow brother, a little child. Here, he says, your brother and partner in the tribulation. So he has identified himself as one among them. John calls himself a servant of Jesus Christ. One of the terms that, key words that Paul uses in most of his letters. Servant of Jesus Christ. What is it? What does it mean? It means that John had learned the lesson that greatness in God's kingdom is not determined by prestige, it is not determined by power, it is not determined by position. Greatness in God's kingdom is defined as being a servant and a slave to all. So, John also became one of the most prolific writers of the New Testament. He is credited with writing five New Testament books, the Gospel of John, okay, then 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and then Revelation. Gospel of John, then, yeah, there is uh, Gospel of John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and Revelation. Right? Four. Right? Did I say five? Yes, four. Four books of the New Testament. Okay? So, uh, now, what does he encourage throughout his letters? Love. And obedience. These are two things that are key in most of the books of John. Love and obedience. Okay, Both the gospel of John and Revelation point to the deity of Christ. Which means he is 
God the Son. Okay. He is God the Son. He is divine. Okay. Now there are four views of, uh, or four, four viewpoints in which the Gospels have been written. Matthew portrays Jesus as the King, the promised King of the Old Testament. Uh, Mark portrays Jesus as the servant who is obedient. Thirdly, Luke presents Jesus as the Son of Man. And John presents Jesus as the Son of God. Four different perspectives of the four Gospel writers. Okay, So, both the Gospel of John and Revelation point to the deity of Christ, the divine nature of Christ. Now, the Gospels, they direct us, they focus on the cross. They lead ourselves to the cross, while Revelation leads ourselves to the second coming. The Gospel of John focuses or leads us to the cross. The Revelation focuses on and leads us to the second coming. All right. So I hope this part is clear. And now, interpretation. See, interpretation of Revelation normally falls into four different groups. I will just tell you the names of it and what it means. We are not going too much into it. Okay. First of all, pre-terrorists. P-R-E-T-E-R-I-S-T-S. Pre-terrorists. They understand that the book is written exclusively in terms of first century. It was written to the seven churches in Asia. All the events that are spoken in the book have come to pass in the first century. We call them pre-terrorists. Okay. Now, that is one way of interpreting it. Secondly, there is a group of people who call, who have this view that um, these are a long chain of events. From Patmos to the end of history, these are long chain of events. It is unfolding throughout history. Okay. Now, those people, we call them historists. It's a historical event. These things took place from Patmos all the way it is going to happen till the end of history. So we call them historists. Preterists, historists. Thirdly, futurists. A group of people who believe that the entire book is primarily going to take place in the end times. Okay, Futurists believe that the entire book, the events and prophecies that are mentioned in this book is going to take place only in the future. Futurists. And then it's a, finally, there is a fourth group of people who calls, who we call the idealists. Okay, What it means is that this is not really history. This is only symbolic pictures. There is no time involved, but timeless truths are told in symbolic way. We have to interpret it only in symbols and signs. It is showing the ultimate victory that truth has over uh, victory, uh, truth has over evil, uh, over falsehood. So this is only to be understood as images and symbols, ideas. So there are four views of interpretation, preterists, historists, futurists and idealists. Okay. Now, the fundamental truth of Revelation does not depend on having a particular viewpoint. Okay? These are available to anyone who will read the book for its overall message. Resist the temptation to become you know, caught up with one or two details. Okay? Resist the temptation. People get fascinated by certain things like Antichrist, 666, all those kind of things that they lose the whole focus of the book. Okay? told you the book itself tells you what the book is about we are not here to categorize people into whether you are a preterist i am a historist they are historists no we are not going to put people labels on people okay what we are going to do is we're going to study the book and we're going to focus on as verse one says the revelation of jesus christ we have to see jesus christ in this book without that any viewpoint is the wrong viewpoint he has missed the point so we have to see Christ in all of this. So, as 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 says, Revelation, like all scripture, is profitable. It reveals Jesus like no other book. Okay, Revelation chapter 1 to chapter 22 reveals Jesus Christ like no other book. Revelation deals with things, verse, chapter 1 verse 19. 
write therefore things that you have seen, those that are that is taking place and those that are to take place after this. Okay? So three timelines are involved. What you have seen past, things that are present and things that are to take place after this future. Past, present and future are there in the book of Revelation. Okay, So prophecy is, like that. Prophecy is not just predicting the future. Prophecy has to do with the past. Prophecy has to do with the present and prophecy has to do with the future. God is the God who is unchanging in the past, present and future. He is there in the past, present and future at the same time. This is hard to understand for us, but it is simple for God because he's there in the past, he's there in the present and he's there in the future at the same time. He can see events in the past, present and future as it is happening in front of his own eyes. Okay, We can't do that. We live only in the present. We can look back at the past. We can hope for the future. Limited. God is unlimited. Okay. So Revelation deals with things which must, which has happened, which is now taking place and which are yet to take place. Fourthly, Revelation is one book that promises blessings to all people who read it, proclaim it, understand and obey it. Okay. So Revelation is a unique book which promises a blessing to all who read it, declare it, uh, who hear it and obey it. Revelation contains unique warnings and challenges to the church. Revelation discloses conditions that will be there during the end times, last days. Okay. Now, one more thing I want to leave with you. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 10. He said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of the book for the time is near. This is not a sealed book. This is not a hidden book. This is a revelation which means a curtain has been moved. Things have been revealed. So this book is something that God wanted us to understand. He wanted to remove the curtain and he wanted us to have a glimpse of what is going to take place. Who is coming back? So this is not a sealed book. This is not to be scared and avoided. No, this is a book that has to be studied, has to be understood. Okay. Now, let's look at Christ in the whole book of Revelation. We'll close today with that. See, since Revelation is a revelation, verse one, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 1 says, Revelation of Jesus Christ. It demonstrates his glory, his wisdom and power. Okay. Revelation demonstrates Jesus Christ's glory, Jesus Christ's wisdom and Jesus Christ's power. It portrays his authority over the church okay. and it gives you his power to judge the world. Okay. Now, how does Revelation describe Jesus Christ as? I'm just going to give you a list of names. We will follow up these names in the coming classes and you will be able to understand what each of these titles mean. I'm just going to read it out. These titles are there for Jesus in this book. First of all, chapter 1, verse 5. Okay, You have three names of Jesus in chapter 1, verse 5 itself. Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, firstborn from the dead, ruler over kings of the earth. Faithful witness, firstborn from the dead, ruler over kings of the earth. Chapter 1, verse 5. Chapter 1, Verse 13, one like the son of man, okay, title of Jesus is the son of man. It is one of Jesus' favorite titles for himself. The son of man did not come for this. Son of man came for this. He was referring to himself as the son of man. Chapter 1 verse 13 highlights that title. Chapter 1 verse 17, when I saw him I fell into the as to death but his right hand on me, fear not. I am the first and the last. He is the first and the last. That's the title of Jesus. Chapter 1 verse 18. The living one. The living one. Chapter 2 verse 18. Chapter 2 verse 18 says. <coughs> uh, the words of the son of God. Okay. 2 verse 18 says he is the son of God. Chapter 3 verse 7. 
gives us another title and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write the right the words of the holy one the one who is holy the one who is true the holy one who is true that is the title of Jesus chapter 3 verse 14 and to the angel of the church in Laodicea write the words of the Amen Jesus' title this is one of his titles the Amen again verse 14 says the beginning of God's creation the beginning of God's creation that's the title of Jesus next we'll find in chapter 5 verse 5 chapter 5 verse 5 two titles we'll find in chapter 5 verse 5 and the word of the elders said to weep no more behold the lion of the tribe of Judah title of Jesus the root of David title of Jesus chapter 5 verse 6 a lamb chapter 9 then come all the way down you know, chapter 19 chapter 19 again a series of uh, names you'll find in chapter 19 22 okay, 19 and chapter 22 19 verse 16 19 was on his robe and on his thigh he has name written king of kings and lord of lords one of his most glorious titles of jesus as the king of kings and lord of lords then come to chapter 22 verse 13 revelation chapter 22 verse 13, and the alpha and the omega same was the beginning and the end chapter 22 verse 16 the bright morning star and finally chapter 22 verse 21 the lord jesus Okay. So I'm going to read it all together. The faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth, the son of man, the first and the last, the living one, the son of God, he who is holy, who is true, the Amen, the beginning of the creation of God, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, a lamb, the word of God, King of kings and Lord of lords, the Alpha and the Omega, beginning and the end, the bright morning star, the Lord Jesus. This book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay, So as we look through this book, we are going to see him glorified, enthroned, powerful, coming back and judging the world. Okay, So let us pray and ask that this evening, we would be blessed by reading this book. Read the first chapter before you go to sleep. And uh, throughout this week, keep reading the book of Revelation. And uh, mark out you know, places where you have doubts. And then we will also discuss it in the next week. Okay? So Revelation is going to be our study for the next few weeks. Uh, come prepared. Start reading the first chapter at least four or five times before we go into the study. Okay? May God bless you as we read this book as we study and understand how to apply this book in our lives. And may it help you to see the Christ in Revelation. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you. We want to thank you that you have revealed yourself in this book. You have revealed us to us so that we would know who you are. We would have a complete picture of the identity of who Christ really is. So that we would not be caught off guard when we see you face to face. And every title is so descriptive about you. God who is so powerful has revealed himself. It gives us a warning about how our life is today. Is it on the right track? Am I drawing closer to you? Am I spiritually growing? Am I reading and studying and meditating your word? Is it important in my life? It also gives me hope for my future. God who is in control of the future. I don't have to worry. I don't have to be anxious. I don't have to be depressed because you are in control. Things of the past, things of the present, things of the future do not disturb you because you are the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. Everything is known by you. And I have put my life into your hands and I have nothing to fear about. We trust you and we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray.